Okay, hey, uh, thank you all for coming. The only reason why I'm up here speaking is because our worshipful master is not here. I'm not that important. Please don't get the uh, idea that that's the case. Uh, my name is Warren. I'm the junior deacon of this lodge. This is our, uh, our fifth, thank you. Uh, I think this is our fifth or fourth installment of our Echoes from the Hall speaker series. Uh, when we're EAs, we're taught that the first thing we're here to do is to learn. And here at this lodge, we uh, wanted to take a particular initiative this year to host events like this, speaker series events out of tiled meetings. We do these every fourth Monday, and the topics vary. Um, today, we have a very, very special program, and I'm going to introduce our speakers so I can get off the stage because he's got more to say than I do. Uh, Ernest Chapman is coming up to speak about the correlation between Freemasonry and music and a variety of other topics in regards to that. He is the organist for the Scottish Rite, a musician, a director, a composer, a producer, and probably a couple other things that I just don't know about yet. So please put your hands together and welcome Ernest Chapman. Thank you, Thank you Warren. I uh, appreciate you guys having me uh, come do this. It's been a lot of fun putting this talk together. I got to dig really deep. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of this with y'all. Um, I'm going to start right off by asking a question, and I want you to ask yourself this question throughout the whole talk. What does harmony mean to you? What does the word harmony mean? Does anyone have any? Just right off the top of your head, what does harmony mean? Just raise your hand. Who's got a definition? She's getting along. Say it again? Getting along. Getting along? What else? She drinks in support of all well-governed institutions, especially Say that a little louder one more time. <laughs> Right. Pleasing well, sound. Pleasing sound. Anyone else? Balance. Balance? Okay. The opposite of dissonance. The opposite of dissonance. Now I'm going to challenge that. Okay. That's going to be fun. Um, so just be thinking about what you think harmony means, because you'll probably see some things in this talk that will deepen and enrich your idea of what harmony means. Um, so after the presentation's over, I'll ask it again. There's a hidden harmony in the world around us. It reveals itself to anyone with eyes to see and ears to hear. Simple example, right off the top. Sound vibrations create geometric patterns called cymatics. There's an example of the vowel A in the word sand. So A, that sound, creates the same geometry as the north pole of the planet Saturn. That's kind of interesting. How is that? Is, is Saturn saying the word? Is Saturn saying something? What's going on here? Um, okay, so there's a lot of things that have this structure to them, and to a lot of people, this is not very remarkable. A lot of people think it's just kind of cool. To an initiate of the ancient mysteries, this would be considered evidence. It's not just cool, uh, it actually does something. Evidence of what? It's evidence of the interconnectedness of all things. So. You look at Frater Albertus. He's a, a very famous 21st, 20th century alchemist, Rosicrucian. He defined alchemy as the science of raising vibrations. So this usually raises more questions than anything else. What are you talking about? What, what vibrations are we raising? Um, is there an instruction manual somewhere? So it, it turns out there are a few instruction manuals to raising vibrations, but they're mostly books made out of stone. And these books made out of stone are written in forgotten languages. So good luck figuring that out. To make this more confusing, these stone books are also really big clocks. So um, they're clocks. That's a big, you're looking at a bunch of clocks. But they're not telling time like we're used to. They were designed to track really long cycles of time using nothing more than stone and light. The symbolism of these ancient stone books, which are also clocks, is built on a system of harmony often referred to as the music of the spheres. It's a musical instrument bigger than anything in the entire world, played by an invisible hand. So what do you think that means? We'll get to it. <laughs> a musical instrument bigger than anything in the world played by an invisible hand. The system of divine proportion was learned by the adept and initiate Pythagoras, who often gets credit for it, but it, he clearly learned it from older sources. After all, these books of stone, which are also clocks, existed long before Pythagoras was born. 
These stone books, which are also clocks, are scattered throughout the world. Some of them are many thousands of years old, others barely over a hundred. So think about what this might mean. People don't just build stuff like this by accident. What was the purpose of these mind castles? And more important than the what, I want you to think about the who. Who built these books of stone? What was their intention? Where did their lineages go? Who were these lovers of wisdom, the philosophers who raised the stones to make temples and who raised their tones, or as Frater Albertus would say, vibrations of their own consciousness in the temples of their bodies? Who were they? What were they doing? Did they leave anything behind for us to discover? Is there a Cracker Jacks box prize, some kind of secret decoder ring that can allow us to understand what they're saying in these stone books? And if the secret decoder ring were ever lost, like a word that was forgotten, would it be possible to rediscover what was lost by using the light of reason to read the book of nature? That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> Let's investigate. Who knows who this is? Buckminster Fuller. Um, Buckminster Fuller hailed as one of the greatest minds of our time, 20th century futurist, philosopher of structure, the inventor of the geodesic, uh, geodesic dome. He popularized a word which is now very overused in corporate lingo, which is synergy. He described it as the behavior of whole systems, unpredicted by the separately observed behaviors of any of the system's separate parts. So, you know, to, to kind of put that in layman's terms, synergy is the study of whole systems where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So let's take a look at a very familiar whole system, the seven liberal arts and sciences, which should be, should be very familiar to us for obvious reasons. But how closely have you looked into it? So these studies lay at the foundation of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. They're broken into two groups. The first group is the trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and it helps to look at them in a particular sequence. This is the foundation for research, analysis, evidence gathering, publication. It's really the foundation of education itself. So let's look at grammar. It's more than just subject-object agreement. Grammar is a stand-in for a much bigger idea. This is the collection of verifiable facts and evidence and the structure of the language that we use to describe those facts. So with grammar, we learn how to listen, how to study, how to inspect. It's really how we collect data and assign words to the data. It's the foundation of knowledge. It's the inputs, it's the water and the sunlight, and it's the fertilizer in your garden. So then the next step is removing contradiction, thinking clearly, that's logic. Logic is, you could think of it as the math behind thought. It's the method and the process of reliable, clear thinking. And it only works in the absence of predetermined outcomes. So in other words, it's not logic if, if you're just analyzing a foregone conclusion. Logic takes the available facts, which must be disprovable, and applies a process to test them, to try them, to discover what is true and what is false. This is super important. We're going to come back to it shortly. So logic is clean mental processing. And then we have rhetoric. Once the contradiction is removed, the third step in the trivium is rhetoric, the art of communication, persuasion, writing, speaking. I'm using rhetoric right now. You're using grammar to take in my rhetoric, and you are exposing it to your own internal sense of logic, either agreeing or disagreeing with what I have to say. Rhetoric is the way that the findings of grammar and logic are shared with the larger community. It's the expression of wisdom. It should be. It's the output. It's the harvest. Great orators can change the world and heal generational traumas with rhetoric done right. There's also a wrong way to do it. So it's often presented out of sequence. Here's what it looks like out of sequence. Anybody know what's wrong with this picture? What do you, what do you see? Logic and rhetoric are reversed. Logic and rhetoric are reversed. So putting rhetoric ahead of logic is the art of burying a premise. It's the science of applying logic to articles of faith that are unable to be proven or disproven. I and mean, let's just be clear, let's call it what it is. There's nothing wrong with doing this. This is actually what theology does. You put faith first and then you build logic on top of that. That's cool, but let's at least be honest about what we're doing when we do that. It's not it's the same thing as science. That's an important distinction. Um, when you do it with bad intentions, then you're like these guys. So, you know, the king from Hamilton, you got 
Jeffrey from Game of Thrones, and then our, our favorite guy up there on the right, uh, Pope Clement V. Um, <laughs> deceptively switching this around is, is a favorite preferred method of control for dictators and kings and authoritarians. That's how they stay in power. So do it at the right order, and you can think for yourself and arrive at your own conclusions based on real data. Dangerous, right? Like, that's kind of scary. <laughs> Anyone who's conducted serious academic research will recognize this. It's very simple. So here's the good guys. They put logic before rhetoric. <laughs> I just put Chuck Norris in there because, you know, why not? <laughs> he uses logic to decide who to punch. So. <laughs> this is one of the biggest problems in the world right now in the area of self-government and sovereignty. If people can be fooled, they can be controlled. But people don't fall into lines so easily when they're educated. So, and it's helpful to have Chuck Norris in your corner just in case someone wants to try and pull a Pope Clement in the middle of an extended work trip to Paris. <laughs> so, so what are we studying with these tools? We're studying the quadrivium. There's seven liberal arts and sciences. So the quadrivium is a big fancy Latin word for, for basically four areas. One of them is number. Number is also called algebra but I'd prefer to call it number with a capital N, philosophical number or proportion. So it's a much bigger idea than what we're used to thinking of number. Numbers have identity. They interact with each other like characters in a great drama. They create ratios in their interactions that allow personalities and meanings to, to commingle, to intermingle. So what happens when you take number and you make it visual? You put it in space. You get geometry. Second stage of the quadrivium is geometry. There's a sequence to this. It's not random. Geometry builds on number. Um, and the simplest patterns that follow these ratios have powerful psychological effects. So because of this, branding people and marketers have used simple geometric patterns for thousands of years. Branding's been around for thousands of years. The, the Great Pyramid is ar arguably one of the best logos in the world. Um, geometric symbolism can be found everywhere. So then if you take number, and you put it in time, you get music. Um, Darth Vader playing the guitar, you get I music. I can't compete with that, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you throw in the Imperial March real quick? <laughs> so, <laughs> you don't have to. So music is number in time. Music is also the sound of math, or liquid architecture. It's recycled and reused in a rapidly melting embrace. And like water, music is a medium of transmission for other things like making tea. The water transmits whatever you made the tea with. So music can be a raging flood, plowing through entire generations and rearranging the intellectual landscape. It has the healing power of a sauna and the destructive force of a hurricane. It's capable of shaping and altering the brain waves and the heart waves of individuals and collectives very rapidly. It is a direct portal into the collective unconscious. Music taps into the wisdom as well as the idiocy of the crowd. It's a linchpin for humanity, like the ring in the nose of a bull, and it leads us to the promised land or over a cliff, depending on who's playing and what they're playing. So music can raise vibrations, quite literally, because it's vibrations. As Frater Albertus would say, music can also lower vibrations. It's very powerful. I've been a musician since I could first sing, played instruments since I was five, studied music at Hampshire College, Berklee School of Music. Since then, I've played and taught music professionally. Um, I've shared the stage with a lot of amazing artists, both famous and obscure, made records, scored movies, uh, and I play music in the Scottish Rite degree. So for me, music is what puts all this together. And that's the lens that I see astronomy through. So the, the last liberal art is astronomy. And you might think, well, why, would we, why would we study astronomy? That seems kind of random. Like, what else is on the list, you know? Like, great, we're going to look through a telescope, and what's that going to tell us? Um, well, when the geometry of nature is seen as patterns of number moving through space and time, that's astronomy. So that should tell you something. Astronomy is number two, number in space and time. It was actually very important in ancient times for civil engineering, for the planning of empires. It was required for navigation, for planting and harvesting crops. It was also a critical aspect of national security, economics, and war. Astronomical observations were passed down from one generation to the next, encoded in these great books of stone 
that were built as giant clocks to track the movements of the sky. People thought this was important for some reason. So maybe we should try to figure out what mattered to them. This is operative mythology. So I say operative because it's mythology that can actually trigger a transformational event if put in a ritual context. In the lesser, greater mysteries, you come out differently than you went in. It changes you for the better. It should. That's what initiation is designed to do. It should activate higher parts of your nature, putting you in alignment with universal harmony. Raise your vibrations. Otherwise, what's the point? What are we doing if we're not activating something that, that makes us better? We say making good men better. Well, how are we doing that? Well, there's one way of doing it. The temples are the hardware. So think of temples like hardware, and the software is the mythology or the story, something that runs on a distributed network of quantum computers, otherwise known as the brains of all the humans, of all the people that are alive at any given time that are actually working together to create these experiences. Your brain is a quantum computer, and our, and our quantum computer brains are all networked. They're all connected through our hearts. So depending on what you believe, there's also a cloud backup system called the Akashic Records, but I'll leave that to another talk. <laughs> this is an image of Stonehenge on the summer solstice. Long ago, when the great megalithic monuments such as Stonehenge, the pyramids, the Temple of the Sun were built, it was impossible to measure these great distances with more than 99% accuracy. So it's approximate, but the Great Pyramid also lines up with very specific star patterns. It's really remarkable. So they were pretty sophisticated. They figured some stuff out. But the thing that's crazy and the, the subject of this talk and what this whole thing is the setup for is actually hearing and seeing the music of the spheres at the same time. So that's the setup. That's the frame. Now let's look at what goes in the frame because this is the crazy part. We're going to explore three interconnected areas. The first area is the overtone series. So these are the then we're going to go through the geometric patterns in music. And then we're going to go through the orbital resonances. I said orbital resonances. <laughs> I'm just laughing because some of these words are hilarious. But the orbital resonances of the planets in the solar system. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to see how these all connect to very familiar symbols that should be obvious to anyone in this room. So the overtone series, you know, we have a visual sine wave pattern here. Think of it as a string that's been plucked. So if you could just pluck an open string. That note that you're hearing, if, let's say it was a G, I think that was an E, right? If you hit a G, th there's no such thing as a single note. Every note is a bunch of notes. They're all happening at the same time, and you're only really hearing the low note. So there's other notes that are a lot quieter that are, like if you look at that at the top right, all those notes are in there. You just can't hear them. They're super quiet. So how do you reveal those notes? So if you could please hit the, the fundamental again, hit a, hit a G. I want to give you um, a different one. Or you know what, let's, let's not do a G. Let's do whatever's easy to make overtones with. Yeah, there you go. So you get the, hit, a, hit a fundamental like an octave lower. Great, so that fundamental note, we're gonna, we're gonna reveal the first overtone by placing the finger halfway up the string and just preventing the low note from, from playing. So if you could do the, the octave overtone of, uh, of any note um, at the 12th fret. At the 12th fret, yep. So you hear that, but then hit the, hit the bottom. So you hear two different notes. You're actually hearing the same notes at the same time. It's just he's muting one of them. He's making one of them be quiet so you can hear the other one. So that actually goes through the second overtone. If you could play a fifth harmonic. Um, on the ninth fret? Yeah. So that's the one, two, three, four, five. You hear the, the fifth degree is in there. And they get quieter and quieter. So then you get the third overtone, um, double octave. Right, and then the fourth overtone is a major third, and this one's gonna be hard to hear, but if you could try to get a major third harmonic. Um, I, got a, I got a better idea. That's the five. Um, oh wait, we're in E. Yeah. Sorry, uh, let's see. There it is. So, and that's, a, that's displaced by an octave, but you get the point, right? So the overtones are there. Um, and they go up in a very specific order. And 
no matter how differently tuning systems have evolved, once you go higher into the thirds and beyond, there's more variety in the tuning of the individual notes. So there's a lot of different culturally relevant approximations of this that become our scales. The different tuning systems in different cultures have different opinions on how to tune various intervals. So this sometimes confuses people because they say, oh, well, you know, in this culture they have these tunings and in that culture they have those tunings. So, so the physics of music must be culturally relevant, uh, culturally um, relative, right? But no, it's, it's, it's actually not. The overtone series is not culturally constructed. The overtone series just is. Uh, and as we'll see, the overtone series is, is in um, the solar system too. So when you, put, when you put these notes together and you jump them down octaves, you jump them down into the same octave and play them all at once, you, you can get a major chord. So just play any major chord. So the, what you're hearing is one note from the overtone series and then all those high notes are dropped down to be next to each other and then played simultaneously, that's where we get chords from. So one more time, major chord, please. So the rules of Western harmony define consonant intervals or pleasing intervals as octaves, fifths, and major and minor thirds. And it's no accident that the loudest, clearest overtones in the overtone series are octaves and fifths and major thirds. And when you put them together, that's the major chord. So in music, there's perfect consonances defined by Johann Fuchs in 1725, um, perfect consonances, the octave, the unison, the fifth, and the fourth. And then there are imperfect consonances, the major third, the minor third, the major sixth, and the minor sixth. Um, if you could just play each one, one at a time, any key doesn't matter, just play an octave. Um, yeah, sure. Yep, and then uh, a fifth, and then a fourth. So one, four, five, most common chord progression of all time. It's just made out of perfect consonances. It's, it's the bread and butter of everything. It's the most basic stuff. Now play a major third. Then minor third. Major sixth. Minor sixth. Oh. Wait. Uh, major sixth. Major sixth, yeah. Minor there you sixth. go, minor sixth. Yep. So think about the perfect consonants as the cake and the imperfect consonants as the icing. Um, there's a reason I'm showing you this, because it's about to become visual in a whole different way. So if we go into the solar system, and this is, the, this is part of the fun part here, Looking at the music of the spheres, you're actually looking at visual patterns, but there's actually data behind this. Um, and I've gone through and looked through this data and tried to prove it wrong, because I just didn't believe it. Um, but I couldn't prove it wrong. I ended up proving it right. <laughs> um, there, we are working with approximations. If you're trying to land a probe on Mars, you're probably going to crash the probe if you're using this for your, your, uh, your, you know, your system to aim the thing. But if you're looking for philosophical meaning in the patterns in the sky, you're going to find it here. It's really interesting. Um, so every celestial ob object has a different orbit, whether it's a moon, a planet, or something else. So this chart has a lot of the orbits on it. Orbital resonance is it's what happens when the orbits of different celestial bodies create a fixed ratio. So you got 2 to 1 or 3 to 2. This is explained by the laws of planetary motion, Bode's law and the equations that govern what's called Lagrangian points, um, which best left for a physicist to explain. So you can go down the rabbit hole on that. But what I want you to think about is that these different planetary bodies, um, they're floating around in the solar system. They're locked into stable patterns for millions and millions of years. And those stable patterns are, the, are what you just heard uh, Ryan play on the guitar. It's funny that sometimes the resonance can even cause them to be ejected from their orbits and kicked out of the solar system, like when you're jumping on a trampoline and, um, and you bounce your friends so high they fall off the trampoline. So locking things into resonance can actually create really interesting patterns that kick them out. Um, again, I, I thought this was ridiculous when I first heard it. I was like, okay, that sounds cute, but there's no way this is real. So I tried to disprove it, and this presentation came out of me trying to disprove it. <laughs> the orbits of Pluto and Neptune create a musical fifth. 
So um, when you do the math, this comes out to like 99% accuracy. There's some other factors that bring this up to 100% if you take into account the standing wave patterns plotted out by, by the Lagrangian points. Lagrangian points. Uh, that gets a little more complicated than I want to get into here, but I just want you to know there's a lot behind this. And you know, if there's any physicists in the room, I welcome you to explain or challenge me on it because it's fascinating, but I'm not a physicist. Um, I'm looking for philosophical meaning. So if you go into cymatics for a minute and you look at all these diagrams, there's a visual correlation. It looks a lot like the Lagrange points, the Lagrangian points in the solar system. Um, they create nodes that are millions of miles away from each other. Exact orbital periods have a margin of error that's made up for by these nodes that are out millions of miles away. It's kind of like a giant musical instrument being played by an invisible hand. If you go back to Pluto now, this ratio is also the second overtone in the overtone series. So when we were talking about the overtone series, now we're seeing the overtone series express itself in the solar system. That's the music of the spheres. Um, can you play Smells Like Teen Spirit real quick? <laughs> that fifth is happening. So there, there it is. <laughs> That's happening in the sky right now. The moons of... <laughs> just Ryan playing Smells Like Teen Spirit in Neptune. <laughs> so the moons of Jupiter create octaves, if you could play some octaves. Ganymede, Europa, and Io create one to two and two to four ratios. Here's a list of the mean motion orbital resonances. They're unisons, octaves, fourths, and fifths. So if you could just work through those again, unisons would be Jupiter's asteroids, Saturn's pr precession against Neptune's orbital precession. It gets pretty nerdy. Uh, you, can, you can go through it later, get the deck, get the, <laughs> if anyone is interested in looking at the data. Um, there's no dissonances though. So you'll notice there's no minor seconds. Play a minor second. Oof. Uh, let's see. Bear with me. There's no, there's no minor seconds in there. There's no tritones in these. There's no augmented sixths. They're not, th those intervals are not happening here. Um, now, one of the most stunning orbital resonances is the Venus-Earth resonance that approximates the golden mean ratio. The relationship between Venus and the Earth traces the blazing star in the sky. Um, so if you look at the, the star, you, know, you can see it. It creates a star pattern if you measure it at certain points. And the ancients knew this, and they, they baked this into their symbology and their iconography. They baked it into the branding for all the mystery schools. They're using Venus as the blazing star. But it also is, you know, it's in the Rosicrucian symbol of the rose on the cross. And that, that five-pointed symmetry is a sacred symbol that if you, if you blow it out three-dimensionally, it creates the dodecahedron, and it, and it also creates the five platonic solids. And that's really important, um, you know, named after Plato, but much older. The five platonic solids we only recently discovered actually create the geometry of the structure of DNA. So, so let's, let's just like stop for a second and think about all these things that are happening. We've got the planet Venus tracing a five-pointed star in the sky, creating the same patterns that are in your DNA that are also the blazing star that's, that are, that's symbols that you see everywhere. And it's all the same math. And the way that we discover it is through the trivium and the quadrivium, which is the seven liberal arts and sciences. Um, it's a really nice way to use that. So it's an underlying pattern of the golden mean, which is the geometry of life. If we go back here, look at some more orbital resonances. We've got um, musical interval intervals here, imperfect consonant rate intervals. So the moons of Pluto actually create a major third. If you could play a major third. Yeah. Um, we also have rhythmic ratios. So the, you know, the, the common ratio is using rhythm. Mars and Venus actually play triplets against each other, one to three ratio. So there's three orbits of Venus for each orbit of Mars, roughly. Um, so Mars is outnumbered by Venus, so you better watch out. <laughs> now this is a fun one. Anybody recognize the familiar symbol at the upper right? 
So the three, four, five triangle, the philosophical significance of the earth, moon, and sun relationship is demonstrated with the concept of squaring the circle through the use of the ratio 22 over seven. And this ratio is core to the geometry of the Great Pyramid. The diameters of the earth and the moon put side by side, stacked on top of each other, reveal a perfect three, four, five triangle on either side. And you can drop the Great Pyramid right in the middle of it and it all fits together like puzzle pieces. So how'd they do that? Back when they thought the world was flat. It's kind of weird, isn't it? It's interesting. And Leonardo da Vinci based this drawing on that geometry, the Vitruvian man. Um, so the Great Pyramid demonstrates the connection between the human form and the measurements and diameters of circumferences of the Earth and the Moon. Yet we're supposed to believe that the people who built this monument thought the world was flat. Um, so you be the judge. <laughs> so there's something that, that I want to point out to uh, that also you see that symbol emerges the the circle and the square the compass makes circles the square makes squares at, at some point this is like so simple it's like kind of obvious but it's all there if you look at notes and colors think about octaves for a minute if, can you play like a low E and then go up an octave so if you look at notes and colors and you think about, even though it's different spectra, light is not the same as sound. Obviously, it's different stuff. Um, but if you were to correlate them to each other, creative people have always done things like this and drive scientists crazy, but it's fun. And you know, creative people invented science, so we might as well have some fun with it. Um, <laughs> you, know, the, you can see higher octaves of sound vibrations and just imagine that they could be colors. You could see them on the same spectrum. Now, I know it's not literally, don't take me literally on this part, but I'm gonna use octaves as a way of, of looking at different meanings of numbers in a second. So if we go to the unison here, Saturn's orbit is approximately the same as the circumference of Mars's orbit. So again, the radius of Saturn's orbit is about the same as the circumference of Mars's orbit. Um, and then the circumference of Saturn's orbit is about the same as the mean diameter of Neptune's orbit. So we, you know, we get into some of the details here, and I'm gonna go through this section a little bit faster because I don't want you to get caught in a lot of reading. I just want you to see that there's a lot to investigate, and I'll just kind of burn through it, and then anybody who wants this later, just ask me and I'll give it to you, and you can study it. Uh, you know, this is almost like an appendix, <coughs> appendix, but I want you to see in the octave, Venus and Mercury have a correlation. One day on Mercury to one year on Mercury because of the way it, it moves around the sun. If you hit the fifth, um, then you get you know, all kinds of detail on the fifth, Saturn's orbit in years. There's, there's a very long and complicated breakdown that I'm gonna not do right now, but you can just know <laughs> Saturn's orbit in years has a tie into the moon, which is pretty fascinating. One year of Saturn is 365 lunar phase cycles. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> this goes on and on and on and on. Saturn's year is 10,759 Earth days, um, you know, so you do the math and it's 364, which is about one Earth year. It's just, it's just crazy correlations to 0.998% of accuracy. Uh, then we got Venus to Earth versus v Earth to Mars, creates a fourth. Then the whole step, the whole step in music is between the moon and Jupiter, they're, they're playing a whole step. Every, uh, you know, every lunar year to the sign out of Jupiter is a whole step, 354 to 399. These ratios have been here for millions of years, just right above our heads. Um, so that section's a little heady. Ernest, what is a whole step? Play a whole step. Right, so it's the next note in the scale that's two half steps away. I'm trying to avoid too much nerdiness, but it's kind of hard to avoid in this presentation. So I figure, you know, anything that's not already understood, you'll just like let it kind of go over you and come back and check it out again if you're interested. So this section, I want to go through a whole bunch of philosophically significant numbers that are a little bit easier to understand. So there's seven notes in every major and minor scale, seven white keys on the piano, seven classical modes. Um, they go back to Samaria. There's seven days in a week, seven classical planets, Earth, Moon, Sun, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Mercury. Did I get them all? 
Saturn, the, the classical planets, which um, correspond to the days of the week. And then there's the seven liberal arts and sciences. When you hit 12s, 12 notes in the scale, 12 months in the year, 12 signs in the zodiac. You got that. You got 12 apostles. And of course, 12 Cylon models of Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> The most significant 12. <laughs> now let's go up an octave to 24. An octave is just doubling. So now we've got 24 major and minor keys that can correspond to 24 hours in a day. Half the keys are major or light, like daytime. Half the keys are minor or dark, like nighttime. It's almost like it was designed by the same people. <laughs> and there's two pillars, two columns with the sun and the moon. Slightly different, but close enough. Now look at 60. There's 60 seconds in a minute. The middle range, average resting heartbeat, 60 beats per minute, one beat per second. Most common musical tempos fall in the range of 60 beats per minute. Um, background mental processing for most people is about 60 pieces of information per second. The electrical grid runs on 60 cycles. Um, 60 is a number that ties together the way time is counted with heartbeats in the brains of the people doing the counting. It's also the equilateral triangle and the Triforce from the Legend of Zelda. Um, so it's an ancient symbol of light, of knowledge, perfection, and divine harmony. Let's look at 72. There are 72 basic hand positions for piano when you play the 24 major and minor chords in root position, first inversion, and second inversion. That's kind of cool. When I figured that out, I was like, all right, what else is there 72 of? Well, in Indian music and Carnatic music, there's 72 scales, each of which corresponds to a 20 minute long period of time. Every 24 hours, all 72 of these scales have had their ideal time to be played. And they map out to like divine gods and goddesses in their cosmology and in their, in their mythology. Um, someone thought of that. Well, the Earth's axis tilts one degree every 72 years. That's, what, that's why an eon or an astrological age takes 2,160 years. 72 times 30. That creates the great year of 25,920 years. Um, that great year cycle creates some interesting visual patterns that I think uh, Brother Driver would be very familiar with from the Royal Arch and Templar symbol symbolism. It's right there in the sky. Um, so here's, you know, procession of the equinoxes. There's, there's a, a tilt, a wobble to the Earth's axis. And these ancient stone monuments are actually measuring, some of them are actually measuring this. So, you know, wrap your head around that in three seconds and we'll move on and you can look at it again later. <laughs> um, the interior angle of a pentagon is 72 degrees. The pentagon is, is built on the golden mean too, which is significant. So now let's go to 432. 432 was assigned by Pythagoras as the note A. Okay, so Pythagoras, he's our guy, right? He's like, you want to play music? Cool. A, 432. <laughs> Great. We don't do that anymore. We're at 440. But let's, let's look at the philosophical significance behind it. Instead of arguing about what our tuning system should be, I want to avoid all that and just talk about philosophical number here. Mars is, uh, sorry, Jupiter takes around 4,320 days to orbit the sun. Mars is around 4,322 miles in diameter. 432 is almost but not quite the square root of the speed of light, uh, the square root of the speed of light to 99.666% accuracy. Now let's go down an octave, 216. The moon is approximately 2160 miles in diameter. The Earth's meridian circumference is approximately 21,600 nautical miles. Each astrological age is 2,160 years long. 12 of those cycles create the great year. Stonehenge actually tracks this great year with the station stones, by the way. Um, they, they mark the locations of star alignments at the extreme ends of the procession of the equinoxes. So that's pretty interesting. Again, people that built these monuments supposedly weren't very sophisticated. Well, maybe it's, it's we who are not very sophisticated. <laughs> you know, with, when all the computers and hard drives of today have sunk to the bottom of the ocean, the ancient landmarks are still going to stand. Let's go down an octave to 108. 108 is the number of the moon. The radius of the moon is 1,080 miles. 
the distance between the Earth and the Sun is approximately 108 times the diameter of the Sun. That's why there's an eclipse. That's why it fits. It's pretty interesting. It has <laughs> interesting um, synchronicity. The diameter of the Sun is 108 times the diameter of the Earth. Again, these are all approximations. I would not tell Elon Musk to try to land a rocket ship on Mars with these approximations. He would miss. But I will tell you that if you're studying symbolism, these things do matter. The average distance between the Earth and the Moon is 108 times the diameter of the Moon. Further strange connections. Saturn's polar diameter is approximately 108,000 kilometers. Saturn's orbital period is 10,800 days. Venus's distance from the Sun is 108 million kilometers. Earth's orbital velocity is approximately 108,000 kilometers per hour. So there's, a, there's 108 beads in Buddhist prayer beads. There's 108 steps in Tai Chi. And there's 108 sun salutations in, in yoga. 108 is considered a sacred number to Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, and Islam. So let's go back up to 432 and go up another octave. 864, bless you. 864, it takes the Earth 86,400 seconds to spin once on its axis, creating a familiar 24-hour day. The Sun is approximately 864,000 miles across. The diameter of Jupiter is approximately 86,400 miles across. Um, and 864 divided by 2 is 432. So we're back to where we started with Pythagoras. Um, so the note A, the approximate diameters of the Sun and Jupiter, and the rotation speed of the planet Earth are all harmonically related through the number 864. And again, okay, not again, but for the first time, I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge we're jumping through different scales and different measurement systems, but that's part of it. That's part of the point, is that these numbers keep popping up in all these places that you wouldn't expect them to pop up. What's tying them together? So this is possibly a familiar diagram to those who've studied esoteric esotericism. Um, so let's tie this back to music. This is an image called the rebus. Rebus is Latin for res bina, or double matter. It is a representation of the end product of the magnum opus, or the great work of alchemy, a symbol of balance between the spiritual and material aspects of an individual's soul. It's created by Basil Valentine 100 years before the establishment of the Grand Lodge of England, which we're supposed to believe was the beginning of Freemasonry in 1770. Yet the symbol contains within it the compass and square, the lesser lights, seven classical planets, and a circle with a square and a triangle in it. So let's see where else these ideas pop up. Has anyone ever taken a music lesson? Raise your hand. <laughs> anyone know what that is? Circle of fifths. Circle of fifths. Scare, the, scare the crap out of every student and start pulling out the circle of fifths. So <laughs> let's make it interesting. Um, like the ancient books of stone that I talked about at the beginning, the circle of fifths is also a clock. It's got 12 faces. It tells musical time. And an interesting thing hap happens when you start connecting the dots. So you get scales, you get geometric patterns. So uh, Ryan, if you could please play a major chord, one, three, five. You could add a seven. A seven? Yeah, one, three, five, seven. So on the left, if you connect those notes, you get that pattern. Now on the right, I just have a major scale. If you could just play it, please play a C major scale. Great. Now, if you go look the other way, minor chord, just play a minor, uh, minor seven chord. Great. And then a minor scale. So there's symmetry here. I mean, there's a reflection. There's, there's some really interesting patterns. So I, I got into this when I was teaching music lessons full time. And, um, and I started having a lot of fun with it. And I started discovering some interesting things. Um, so there's something more, more major than major. It's called augmented. And when you connect the dots on augmented chords, if you could play an augmented chord. Sounds like, whoa. Like I just had my coffee in the morning. I'm like... I don't know, it sounds like a dog going <laughs> <laughs> Augmented chord, it's, it makes you smile, it gives you a lift. It's more major than major, and it's a symbol of light. So the, the whole tone harmony here 
creates the, the diagram of the Star of David, of the cube of space. It creates hexagons. The first thing we looked at in this presentation, if you could play a whole tone scale, please. So it's, it's so far more major than major that it almost feels like you're floating off into space. Um, so it's a symbol of heaven. It's a symbol of light, um, whole tone harmony. And that's what the compass is really the, the tool for, which is, six, this is usually a 60 degree angle. In this image, it's 90 degrees. So pay no attention to that. But um, light is symbolic of heaven, potter, father, the root word for pattern. Um, held by the hand of God, the geometer, the great architect of the universe. So augmented sounds like a question mark. Now let's look at diminished. Could you play a diminished? More minor than minor. It sounds like something's wrong, like something broke, someone's hurting. Um, but it doesn't have to be negative. Diminished can be the beauty of darkness. That's not evil. It's just dark. Diminished chords create squares. If you, if you map them out on the clock of fifths, the circle of fifths. So we've got triangles and squares coming out of music theory that directly correlate to the symbolism of light and dark, heaven and earth, uh, and all the things that go with that. So you put those together, you just put them on top of each other, and you have the symbol that's in the rebus right there. It's just sitting there waiting for you to find it. You put them together, and it gets, you get the same thing. So now in music, we have a thing called the treble clef. The treble clef is also called the G clef. The reason the treble clef is called the G clef is because you draw a little half circle around the note G, and then you go up, and then you do a little loop-de-loo. So if you put the G clef in the middle of that diagram, you end up with a familiar diagram. I just thought that was really cool when I discovered it. It's like, oops. Um, but it gets more interesting because remember Venus and the blazing star? If you take the clock of fifths, and you put in the minor seconds, which is like second hand on a clock, then you connect the same instance of every note repeating itself five times, get a five-pointed star. I learned this from my teacher, Youssef Latif, who got it from John Coltrane. That diagram was written by John Coltrane. Uh, and then Reggie Wooten explained it to me and actually made it make sense. So, um, so there's some pretty wild correlations in here. I made a cleaner version of it. You got the symbol for the golden mean right in the middle of it. And it's connected to all the symbols that we've already looked at. So let's take another look at the overtone series. We got the octave, the fifth, the double octave, the major third. That creates the major triad. If you could just play another major triad, please. Thanks. So that's light. That's, that's the natural world. And then the minor triad, just drop the third a half step. Lowering the third creates dissonance against nature. The reason is because that minor third you're hearing is fighting against the overtone series of the root note. They're sitting side by side and they're not saying the same thing. It creates dissonance, but it's very subtle dissonance because most people can't hear that third in the overtone series that it's rubbing against. That's creating that dark sound. So the interplay between light and dark, it's at the foundation of Western music theory. Um, but in music theory, we have this concept that I think you're all going to like a lot. It's a really interesting concept. We call it raising the third. <laughs> minor scales uh, have seven notes in the scale. And when you build a chord off the fifth degree of an A minor scale, if you could please play an E minor chord. An E minor chord? E minor chord. Play A minor, then E minor. Yep, and then E minor. And we could just sit there and chill and everything's cool. I don't have to go back to A minor. I can just hang out on E minor. I don't have any direction. I'm just kind of floating around. Now play, play an A minor again. And then play an E major chord. E major or E7? Major. And make it a seven. Pause. Are you guys waiting for something? Should we go back home or should we make you wait? Back home. There you go. So raising the third enables you to find your way back home. That's pretty significant. And that's just music theory, so there it is. 
Um, raising the third brings, it, brings your harmony from darkness to light. Um, and that's, again, that's how music theory is often taught. That's, that's the symbolism that's, that's just built into music. It's nothing I added. I'm just, I'm just noticing that this thing over here looks kind of like that thing over there. Um, so the desire to go back home is called cadence. And, you know, darkness is not always bad. You need characters in every, in every drama to be dark. That's what makes things interesting. Um, you know, like Voldemort, you're not supposed to say his name. He's so dark and evil, but he's really just like this sad guy that got hurt and like is hurting other people. You know, poor dude. Like he needs to go to therapy. Um, so, so, you know, we've got nature and we've got things that are not nature. Consonance is just conformity with nature. And this, this basic dualism is the human condition. So there it is. You know, it's all connected. You get the active principle and the passive principle. And the name of the game is how do you balance these things within yourself? So I like to think of it like this. And this is the conclusion. And I know we have a wonderful meal waiting for us, so we're almost done. Um, there's two pillars, yin and yang, sun and moon, active and passive energy. Um, and you are the middle pillar. So you are the temple. This is way older than Solomon's temple. This goes back to ancient Egypt and beyond. Solomon and Pythagoras were the new kids on the block, really. There's a cosmic dance happening between opposing forces within you, expressed musically with consonance and dissonance. And ritual is one way to access a waking dream that you enter into in order to purify yourself in preparation for the raising of your consciousness. Initiation is the beginning of the path, but it's just the beginning. Being initiated is not the destination. It's just passing through the security check on the way to the airplane. So taking flight is up to you. And that's what it means when you hear people say you get out of it what you put into it. But what is it? The temple is you. And this is your dream, and you get to wake up inside of it and manifest your highest vision. So that vision better be good, because when you tap into your true power, you will be manifesting something. This also means that the rebus is a reflection of the ideal future state of you after you've found balance and integrated the different parts of yourself that have to work in harmony in order to activate your full potential. So what are we really raising when we engage in the science of raising vibrations? And why do all these nerdy diagrams matter? What is harmony a stand-in for? Or is harmony what this is really all about? Is there something else? As Carl Sagan famously said, the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. So I take this to mean that we have a very clear purpose. We have a mission summed up in the phrase, know thyself. Does anybody know where that chair is from? House of the Temple. Best chair in the, in the, in the, in the building. <laughs> um, so, the, you know, it's a way for the, the, we are a way for the universe to know itself. So we need to understand that if we are part of a larger thing, a larger synergy, or a larger divine intelligence, knowing ourselves is knowing what we're part of. But it's dangerous to do it alone. <laughs> When you can see the fingerprints of divine design everywhere around you, you can come to realize that you're never truly alone. You're always connected to something greater than yourself. And you start to understand a bigger picture. So let's recap. Let's take a step back and review again the key points. A half step or a whole step back? <laughs> no comment. A just intonation, whole step. Um, both literally and figuratively, Music is a reflection of the solar system and, a and of the collective unconscious of the culture that creates it. The resonance patterns of the overtone series are also frozen into the musical geometry of ancient stone temples and monuments. These structures were built to follow the movements of the heavenly bodies. They're stone clocks whose gears are turned by the rotation of the earth itself, whose hands are made of light. These ancient stone clocks were designed to attune people to the cycles of nature and raise our vibrations through different kinds of rituals and rites. The celestial patterns form tracing boards in the sky that serve as evidence of the interconnectedness of all things. This is collectively remembered 
through myths and allegories which are backed up in the cloud of the superconscious mind of humanity. Long after the people who built the temples, their writings and their organizations have turned to dust, it's very tempting to take these stories literally and in doing so, either fall into idolatry or throw it all away because it seems so absurd and it's not completely perfect. It's approximations. But that's only absurd when you don't know how to read it. So instead of worshiping or discarding the information, we should be investigating it. Learn the language. Decode the symbols for yourself. Our shared mythological hard drive used to store important data about who we are, where we come from, and where we are going inside of coded allegory has some bad blocks. It's got some data corruption in it. And we've inherited a lot of ruins, but it's up to us to decode everything and put the pieces back together and recover what we can. As Buckminster Fuller showed us, we are part of a whole system which is greater than the sum of its parts. What we are calling reality is a harmonic system, a resonant structure within which all kinds of overtone series of different, different forms intermingle on large and small scales, producing cycles within cycles. That's what we call consciousness and reality. We're all made of the same star stuff, to quote Carl Sagan. And we need the seven liberal arts and sciences to really understand this. So this is what we use to inoculate ourselves against shattered, narrow thinking. It's what allows the blind men touching the elephant to actually see the whole elephant. If you were to take a chainsaw and cut the elephant into separate pieces, it would no longer be a whole greater than the sum of its parts. The study of harmony puts the pieces back together, allowing all kinds of measurements to sit next to each other with philosophical ideas intermingling, stimulating discussion and creativity. This is how music raises our consciousness. So allowing these things to come back together is what created the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. The people that created that were having conversations like this, and they were debating the ideas, they were coming up with theories, they were stimulating discussion, and they were leading the world at one point. Um, this is the kind of effect that music also has on our consciousness. In order to see through the clutter, we need the trivium and the quadrivium in our five senses. It's always been the dream throughout history to create harmony for all of humanity. But harmony can't be forced. Cast ye not pearls before swine, it said. So what should we do? We should start by not being swine ourselves. And how do we do this? We improve ourselves. How? Well, one way is by studying a system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. That, that might do the trick. It's a system because it has a framework and a set of rules. There is a progressive nature to the way the information is learned by degree. It's focused on morality because, to quote Spider-Man, the great philosopher, with great power comes great responsibility. And the power of harmony is the power of focusing and directing consciousness, the greatest tool for healing and also the most dangerous weapon on the planet. This power must be respected, never abused, Anyone who truly understands it should come from a place of purity and integrity of character, aligned with solid core principles that cannot be swayed by shifting political or religious or cultural winds. The weather changes all the time, but the cornerstone of character must be unshakable. Otherwise, there's nothing to stand on when you're trying to be just and upright. It's veiled in allegory because allegory is how the information has survived, encoded, hidden in plain sight, during long periods of total social collapse. Allegory is how fairy tales, mythology, and great literature can become safety deposit boxes for encrypted high-level information. And it's illustrated by symbols, because symbols condense and focus consciousness into clarity. That's why branding is so powerful. We should know this because our predecessors, whose lineages we have inherited, are the ones who invented branding in the ancient world many thousands of years ago, and not much has changed in that regard. So I'm going to ask the question again that we started with. Before I blasted you with that fire hose of too much information, part of why I keep laughing is because I'm just laughing at how ridiculous the amount of information is here. Um, but I love it. It's, it's obviously a lot of fun. What does harmony mean to you? I've got two. Go. The first one I thought of was order. Order? Order. Good vibrations. 
What else? Does anyone have any, any upgraded understandings? I was going to say complementary vibrations. Complementary vibrations. Yeah. One with deity. One with deity? Who said that? Yeah? What you got? Synergistic energy. Synergistic energy. Yeah. So question your definition of harmony. That's, that's really the, the point of this, is to get you to ask these questions and start seeing patterns in, other, in, in different places. Um, so with an upgraded definition of harmony, what can you build? What parts of your consciousness will you raise? What dictators and tyrants and oppressive regimes will want to kill you because of the sovereign empowerment you have embraced? How does the great work of raising your consciousness make you into a better person and a cornerstone of your community? If you suddenly found yourself in the position of total authority over your reality, are you prepared to manifest divine harmony into the world through your actions in your own life, for your family, for your community, and for the world? And if you don't think you're ready for that, think again. You're already doing it, whether you realize it or not. It's too late to change that fact, but it's not ever too late to change yourself. So at the beginning of this talk, I asked you to not only think of the what, but think of the who. I asked, who built the books of stone? What was their intention? And where did their lineages end up? Who were these lovers of wisdom? Who were these philosophers who raised the stones to make temples and who raised their tones, raised the philosopher's tone or frequencies of their own consciousness in the temples of their bodies? So a parting thought. Imagine that time doesn't exist. And really, you built all of this. This entire presentation is just a cookbook, the joy of cooking, full of blueprints, and you are an architect. You are the architect. It's you who is there throughout the ages, maintaining the temples, defending them, rebuilding them, when angry mobs burn them down, over and over and over and over and over again. That was you. You did this. And you can do it again. If you are the rightful owner of this lineage, it's up to you to decide what its fate is. What are you going to do with it now? Thank you. Yeah, so, so what we'll do is we'll do Q&A now. Now, the microphone that we're using is on your jacket. I can so repeat the question. When somebody asks a question, just repeat the question. We have a lot of people viewing uh, on our live stream. So that's really the only point to make about yeah. that. Yeah. Do we have any comment questions from there? Um, I'll check. I can okay. see. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. In ancient times, there were numbers that were very significant. I'm just going to repeat your question so they can. And had to have symbolism, too. For yeah. example, the number 40. The number 40, right. The rain, the Bible says it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Raining 40 days, 40 nights. Yeah. Uh, Noah was adrift for 40 days. 40 days, Noah. Yeah. For 40, days. 40 days in the desert, right. And then we have Alibaba and the 40 thieves. Alibaba and the 40 thieves, right. Shows up over and over again. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with the Egyptian mythology in 40, but there's so much here. Like what I just did, what I just shared with you, I think of it like barely scratching the surface. Um, and you can just go so deep in every direction with this stuff. So yeah, I actually didn't get into 40s at all, but there's a deep well there. And whenever you see numbers repeating themselves over and over again, that's usually a, sig a signal that there's something there that someone's trying to say. So it, you know, it just becomes a, a quest to figure it out. Yeah. 40 is a, is a, is the number four. Four is the number of the square. The square, at least in esoteric, has to represent more of the temporal Feel as opposed to the spiritual. 
So 40, 40 is 4 times 10. Yep. I love that. I'm going to repeat that so they can hear. So uh, Brother Tom Driver is saying 40 is, reduces to the number 4, because it's 4 times 10, 4, 0. And 4 is the number of the square, which is the, the number of temporal reality. It's the, you know, it's the, the, the diminished chord, the earth. <laughs> so as you're saying, whenever that number is appearing in mythology, there's a tie-in to the material world or the temporal world. That's an excellent point, and I've never thought about that. It's great. I mean, you could probably go back through everything that you just mentioned and see it all connect. Brother Deems. Chapman, well done. Thank you. Thanks. I really enjoyed that. I had a quick question on the 432 and 440. 432 and 440, yeah. Any commentary on that from you? Yeah, so, I mean, there's controversy over the tuning system raising up to 440. I actually investigated it kind of in a nerdy way one day. I have a piano at my house. And um, I taught myself how to tune it because I was you know, having a bad year that year and <laughs> couldn't afford to pay the piano tuner. So I learned how to tune it. OK job. I've since hired piano tuners again because it, don't change your own oil. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, um, I tuned it down to 432 as an experiment. And it felt different. It felt really good. And I couldn't play along with anything. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the reason why we've raised it up to 440, I don't know the history on that. Um, you might know. Someone else might know. But I don't know why we did that. So uh, it's, it, there's literally nothing mystical about it at all. Um, it goes back to pipe organs and the history of the pipe organ in Western Europe. Uh, every town that they went to had a different pipe organ. They were tuned anywhere from 385 to 480. And, um, wow. So yeah, whenever musicians would go to a different town, they would have to tune to the pipe organ because you weren't going to tune the pipe organ. <laughs> so kind of that. So and it came down to the pipe organs, yeah. Yeah, so um, eventually they, they, the, the standards started to kind of tighten up until eventually it just settled on 440. Um, they felt like that was kind of, kind of mostly in the middle of where everything was, and, and several big orchestras standardized that. Yeah. And, um, and then after then, it, it just it, it gained widespread popularity, and, and now we use 440. Um, it's important to note that 432 is almost exactly a half step down from standard 440. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there, there are a host of musicians who do use uh, a half step down, um, notably, and, and I'm sure it comes as a, as a huge surprise, Oh, my mom does that. Singer songwriters always tune a half step flat and then put the capo on the first fret because yeah, it's, it's easier for their voice, you know? Yeah, it's really a thing. I don't know. Uh, but so, one thing about 440 versus 432, I want to encourage you to think about it. I'm going to give you, a, I'm not going to give you the answer, but I'm going to give you a frame. And the frame is literal versus symbolic. So, 432, the way I like to think of it and, and what the, what's in this presentation is looking at the symbolic nature of how that number and all of its octaves above and below if you double it or have it, directly plug in to all these other things you can observe. That tells you something about how things are connected that's philosophical. And then the, the, the literal, you know, what the orchestra is tuned to, it's not always going to be the same thing. And if I wanted Elon Musk to send me to Mars and land on Mars, I'm not going to go by any of these approximations, even though they're all like 99.998% correct. I don't want to die. In a, in a spacecraft accident. So I'll go with the physicists who are going to hit the target exactly. If you look at the frame, it's a different objective. One objective is to tell you something about philosophy, meaning, your mission, your vision and values of who you are and what you're connected to. Another objective is to like hit a target. <laughs> so these are not the same thing, and that's OK. I struggled with this at first because I got worried that because these were approximations, that we would somehow have a problem. But then I realized the golden mean is an approximation. It's what our bodies are built on. And no body, no human body, is perfectly 1.618033987, blah, 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 because it's an infinite number. You can never hit it. And when I realized that, I realized, well, that's kind of what this is all about. You're never going to hit perfection. 
you can chase perfection. So we're on this journey and we're never going to get there. And that's okay. That's the frame I like to see that in. I hope that makes sense to you. Any, uh, any other questions before we go eat? <laughs> yes, Renato. So what is a practical way of using the knowledge of harmony as I'm presenting it in our daily life? Um, for me, I just love studying it. And, it. and it introduces me to new ideas that I wouldn't have had. It starts conversations. It causes me to, to sort of marvel at the wonder. You know, if, if I'm in a, it's about state control. So if my state of consciousness is survival, if it's a low vibration of I just have to survive and eat something and, you know, fight or flight. If I'm down in that level, then, then that doesn't really feel good and that, that's not something I want in my bloodstream. That's not good for my health, for my longevity. If I can raise my consciousness up to a level of having those fundamentals taken care of and then s sort of putting my mind and my heart and my spirit and, and my hands on higher studies, then I'm always going to be able to kind of get into a flow state. A flow state is like where you're, you're not really, it's like riding a bicycle. Do you think about riding a bicycle? No. So if you're not thinking, then you're connected to something internally through your own consciousness that feels like it's bigger than you. Man, that feels good. I want to feel good. This feels good. If I feel good, I show up in a different way. If I show up with positive energy, um, I was doing a sales training earlier today and the entire point of the sales training was, hey, there's technique and tactics and there's like objection handling and there's things you can say to get the person to like pull out their wallet. And, but some of the best salespeople don't do any of that. They just show up on the call and they've got a vibe and it feels good and you trust them and you know that they care about you. And the, or it's like, if it's like the Xfinity sales guy that's calling you that hates his job that wants to like, quit. It has no, nothing in his voice that tells you that he cares about getting out of bed in the morning. You, you know, that's not as, which one do you want to be? So, you know, if this lights you up, then go for it. And if not, then okay. But I think I understand your question. It's like, wh how do you apply this in everyday life? How do you activate your sense of childlike wonder and curiosity? Well, for me, it's realizing that the musical patterns <laughs> that we play in, in music every day or in the solar system, wait a second, that's too crazy. That's too crazy. Um, I've, got to I've got to understand that. I've got to disprove it. And I'm having fun. Does that help? So I like sharing that with you because it's like, this could be fun. It's, it's also completely crazy. I'm like, <laughs> what? You're just making this up. All right, I'll give you the deck and you can try to prove it wrong. <laughs> Sweet. Hey, another round of applause for Ernest and Ryan. Thank you. Super cool. All right. That was good. Cool. Yeah, and also a huge thank you to everybody online for joining us. Well, Ernest, we, I need you to come back up here because we do have something we want to present to you. Oh, no. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you everybody online for joining us. Very much appreciated. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of Scottish Rite Masons in this room, Ernest being one of them. And uh, the Knights of St. Andrew, 